Okay, so next up, we're going to default uh, CMC. Default, go for it. So my, my question for you is, what should dissidents in the West be doing in the face of increasing corporate censorship that you, know, you yourself was just, were just recently subjected to? Honest advice is move carefully. Uh, don't try your best not to get deplatformed. It's definitely not um, something you want. And then have one foot on the surface and have one foot underground. And then have a foot in between. So have one foot on the surface, which is the surface web. Have one foot on Telegram. And have one foot on Rumble, right, in between. And you got to be everywhere, though. You can't just go to the alternative platforms and expect anything to happen. You got to have your, you got to like have a funnel, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. With so that. the oh. sur the surface web is very vital. You you can't if you get deplatformed from all the surface web, you just don't exist anymore. You know, my Twitter just got banned, and well, what what do you think about like the rise of like phenomenon like the NAFO troll army? Uh, a, it's so cringe. It's so super cringe. B, it's so fake. It's so clearly an attempt to astroturf or Reddit army. And three, you know, these NAFO people are just, if you think about it, they seem like, oh yeah, we're a tough army. We're NAFO. But they're really just an organized snitch brigade. So let's just call them OSB. The OSB. The Organized Snitch Brigade. And that's what they are. They're just snitches. All they do is tattletale to big tech to ban people that they don't like. I mean, like, you know what? I feel like we need to, like, bring back the culture war to this. No one's doing that. If you had a bunch of SJWs having an organized thing... Oh, we have to deplatform everyone. Everyone would, like, rightfully call it the most cringe shit in the fucking world. Oh, you're just what? You want to tattletale on people that disagree with you? You're a pussy. You're a fucking snowflake. So yeah, we need to start just calling them the snowflakes because that's what they fucking are. They're just an organized snitch brigade that bans people whose opinions are too like they they just can't fight. They they use all these words. Like, oh, you're a Russian propagandist. At the end of the day, these are fucking snowflakes that are butt hurt that people have a different opinion on them about this conflict than they do. So we need to bring back the culture war aspect. Let's start calling them snow. They're snowflakes. They're the NAFO they snowflakes. The NAFOs. It's like a like calling you names they they just out and out just violate tos as well like they'll post they'll they'll post a gore right like like bought yeah. dead bodies like slain russian soldiers and then they'll say things like um genocide the russian orc pigs you know so it's like yeah yeah no no that's definitely like like some kind of like digital brown shirt shit just going on yeah yeah definitely but I mean, at the end of the day, I wouldn't be in... I don't care about NAFO. All they do is deplatform people, whatever. And every single one of them in real life is a... Looks like Dylan Burns, so make of that what you will. <laughs> Dylan Burns is one of the only NAFO people where you know what they look like. That's what they look like. They look like Dylan Burns. So there you go. You know, do, do you think there's any lessons to be drawn from, like, the experience of the Bolsheviks in the early years when they were, like, operating under conditions of severe... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Lenin, Lenin's very, um, he's very big on this. One foot in, one foot out. You got to have one foot in the underground. Every opportunity you have to be on the surface, take it. But have an organized presence. Have an underground organization. Also have a uh, surface presence as much as possible. It's very important. So, I'm, not, I'm not too familiar with like the details of, of that period of Bolshevik history, but like, how did... How did the party actually manage to get their propaganda, get their you know media out there, uh, out to the masses? It had a very, it had a, it had a critical structure, a Kantian critical structure, which meant they had a very acute way of differentiating the input that goes into their output. So the input is all illegal and it's all underground and stuff, but the output is very carefully refined to avoid the censors and very like. So they had a very strict, basically like dog whistling, right? Like that's it's like that, like the idea of like the dog whistle. Not like ne no, not not necessarily. It was more like they yeah, knew no. what they could and couldn't say. But even if you follow all the rules, there's still contradictions on the surface. So you accentuate those contradictions. So even if you are fully submitting to the censorship, 
you can mm -hmm. still exploit contradictions at on the surface and then but yeah, at a certain yeah. point it becomes dialectical at a certain point when you accelerate see this is what happens to me when you accelerate those contradictions to a certain point they're going to say okay now we're censoring that you're banned so like that's for example before you could say whatever you want about foreign conflicts like russia and ukraine so i accelerate that contradiction right but because i'm so effective at it they're like okay you know what we're going to start censoring this and for the first time twitch does the unprecedented and they, they ban someone over their stance on a foreign war so that's what happens you just have to keep you know it's like bob and weave you got to keep fucking they will never fully catch you the bourgeoisie is incapable they will they cannot catch they cannot catch a, a partisan right you can you will always be able to wage the class struggle no matter what any censorship even any any even under fascism you can do it doesn't matter they will never be able un, until they identify you and by the time they identify you you should have already moved to another place so for me, another, it's yeah. me. It's different because I'm a personality on the internet. I can only be one person. Do you know anything about like the internal stuff, like how how the uh, Bolsheviks internally, like how they internally organize their their maneuvering around the uh, czarist, you know, censorship? Like they used a lot of pseudonyms, so the mm -hmm. an an anonymity thing. They also. There was never a point where the censorship was so harsh that you couldn't say anything. So, you know, they just... And also, sometimes the topics that they were engaged in in polemics were so esoteric that censors didn't even understand it. They were like, what? Because it's like this intra-Marxist fighting and factionalism. So th there was many advantages, but it never got so drastic. Like, if it got to the point where all political dissidents gets banned well there's still room for economic dissidents or cultural dissidents and things like that and if all dissent is banned completely that's a level of totalitarianism if you want to use that word it's never been experienced anywhere in human history maybe except today where we're getting to that point and in those circumstances i think it's the con it's the problem of consensus you've just gotta smile and maneuver how you can but there will always be contradictions and there will always be differences even in the Don't ruling the even in the status the quo there's always going to be contradictions even in the status quo consensus so to the so like to the public like any individual bolshevik would have multiple like personas or aliases yeah uh, like that, that seems to me like it would be it would be similar to like any individual on like mainstream social media yeah they would they should have multiple accounts multiple alts but then yeah. internally internally the bullshit like did the party like keep track of who like like the personas or like the the you know the the uh, yeah the, the personas or the uh, pseudonyms that each each cadre like uh not utilized? not always no sometimes people were anonymous to everyone but it was still it still worked discursively still but and there's also things like plausible deniability you had sometimes where everyone knows this is lenin but there's no way to prove it so yeah so like, like you had so in the bolster party you had like the, the people kind of creating uh, i'm going to use i'm going to be anachronistic but like you had the lenins right like, like like the content creators and then it seems like you would have like the rank and file cadres who you know, maybe they also like wrote their own like you know created created their own media they wrote, wrote pamphlets or articles but their main duty was to take the content you know the, the pamphlets the writings of like the lenins of the party and then through their you know secret shadowy maneuverings uh propagate that to the masses what i might am, am i correct in that uh would I be correct in that? In that like, well, if if the content of his writings is is made for that purpose, like okay, we need to do this, perhaps. But sometimes it was just polemical, so the polemical nature is different. It's like you know what is to be done. Well, there's a dispute over that, and there's a whole polemical war over the strategy. You know, it's it needs to be emphasized. No, no, I have to disagree with, not disagree, but I have to push back on what I just said. No, because Lenin wasn't a content creator, first and foremost. He was a, 
he was a part of an organization, right? A party. And those are two very, very different things. There were former protocols in place for collective action through the party. So no, that people were not engaged in actions on the basis of his content creation, but on the basis of formal decisions made by the party. Now, how do those decisions happen is democratic centralism. So the significance of Lenin's content creation is more for the party rather than the masses. So that's what you meant by the polemics. The polemics would essentially yes, be precisely, uh, yeah. like consumed internally within the party. Yep. And then some stuff is for the outside, but well, that's then, that's mainly not penned by Lenin. That's penned by their newspapers, or that's penned by their, you know, their their the party newspaper, right? Which is issuing public. So then, yeah, yeah. Then I guess like so, the the newspapers, the public facing newspapers, would create this content for the for the consumption of of the public masses. Precisely. Yeah. Then, I guess then then like what I'm interested in is like. How would um, the, the party what? formed around the newspaper? The decision, like being able to come to a consensus as a group about what content to curate and publish, that was like the embryo of the party. Do you think? So. Do you think that, that there's like a similar development that's going on with like online uh, uh, online communities, like 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 your your community, for example? I don't because I think the nature of organization has changed in the age of cybernetics. The control and organization of people has so drastically changed that the protocol of political association today doesn't actually seem like it's based on the curation of information. It seems that it's based more on precedent and legitimacy for example like you know the state the american state is that based on the curation of information no it's based on being a historical legitimate institution passed down from history i'm not sure i follow what i, I don't think i understood the things that. that make people collectively associate today and act i don't think are directly based on organizations based on the curation of information i think being organized for example information bubbles where different ideolo ideologies define themselves based on like their echo chambers and shit right yeah 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 i don't think that's the same as an authentic political distinction what, what is what do you mean by authentic political distinction an authentic political distinction is based on the organization of will right different organization of will and conflict thereof, right? Stemming thereof. But there is an acute discontinuity between information and politics today. They're not the same, in other words. Like, for example, an info warrior is not the same as a soldier of a state. Right, right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, DFD, for the same